begin transmission. So here's a little spider story for you. Uh, remember that, that video at the beginning of the Keyless Rada lecture where we had this giant spider dragging this, this helpless little possum back to its lair? Well, that, um, that story haunts my memory and sometimes my, my nightmares. And this, uh, the spiders, uh, the more we learned about them, the, the kind of creepier they, they seemed to me. And Isabella was the one who told us about this spider. She experienced it. And she didn't tell us the story when we were kind of safe in our nice, well-lit habitats. Um, she told it to us as we were traveling through the woods at night um, in the forest. And that's not the only story she, she told us. So as she is kind of guiding us through the forest, she shows us this, this video of what could be lurking right outside the, the, the beams of our lights. And then she tells us that one morning when she was camping, she woke up and it was still dark and she was fumbling around and she reached for the zipper on her tent and she pulled it, but it uh, was, was not a zipper. It was, she actually had grabbed the leg of one of these giant spiders and pulled it down onto her lap. Um, she was, of course, pretty cool about it. Um, she uh, nothing, nothing really gets under her skin, but that thought terrified me. And as she was telling us the story, we kind of stopped for a little break, and I was sitting on a little log with my hand kind of down on the log, and just kind of contemplating, <clears throat> you know, the futility of life and how terrible spiders um, are. And I had my hand down on the log, and I felt something kind of brushing up against it. And it was a little bit of a windy day, and I was engaged in conversation. My thoughts were elsewhere, and I didn't really think anything of it. I just kind of, you know, moved my hand, and it, and you know, stopped touching it, and whatever it was. Uh, but then, uh, you know, it kind of kept kept coming back, and I kept moving my hand, but it kind of kept um, um, thudding against my hand until eventually something clicked in my mind and um, I realized you know, I had subconsciously been flicking something away and something clicked in my mind that this 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 could be <laughs> this could be a spider. So I looked down at my hand and there on my hand was this gigantic leaf that had been blowing up against my hand. And um, there was was no spider. Um, but but what if it had been? What if that had been a big spider? That that would have been uh, that would have been pretty scary. Um, so uh, that's that's the little spider story, and um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy this lecture on a bunch of spiders. In keeping with our theme about uh, heroes and villains, most people consider spiders to be uh, villains, but um, also insects are villains, and if a villain kills a villain, then it's kind of a hero, right? So spiders, in, um, in their own ways, are um, significant heroes in the natural world. They are, in many ecosystems, the dominant predator of insects that keep a lot of the, the nasty insect pests at a low level. So they're, they're effective killers of mosquitoes and um, flies that carry diseases. And so spiders are heroes in some sense. And so uh, we'll keep up with that theme of heroes and villains among arthropoda today as we talk about some um, keyless serrates from Earth's history. And again, there are, uh, as we go through the species on this planet, uh, we haven't named them all, but they are, have the same ecological roles as some of the insects and spiders um, and the relatives that have gone extinct on Earth. So uh, we can see from um, Earth's past what um, used to be, and then we can kind of look at this Earth now and see what should be. We'll begin with the horseshoe crabs. These are in phylum arthropoda, subphylum chelicerata, and class meristomata. So chelicerata, they're defined by having chelicerae, and they have pedipalps, they have um, four pairs of walking legs, and they have no antenna. The meristomata, um, this group is a very small group, and in the fossil record, it's actually a lot larger, more, more speciose, uh, many more species, but um, there are uh, just a few that are um, still alive, and, or at least used to be alive a thousand years ago. And this is these little spiky things sticking up, remember what those are called? Those are the telsins. They act as a little as a little rudder. 
These uh, Chelis rata are unique in having a carapace that kind of protects their body. And uh, Limulus is the horseshoe crab genus. Horseshoe crab is the common name, but it's not a crab, right? Um, so you can tell me precisely why it's not a crab on an exam or something like that, perhaps. Uh, what's interesting about these guys? Well, what is going on in this picture is a, a massive a mating swarm. So during breeding season, they will all get together and mate in these, these giant, um, giant swarms. And so it's kind of a, a way to um, find, they're usually fairly solitary animals. And so uh, these nice mating parties um, are a way for an individual to find a mate easier than it would be if you're uh, tracking down as an individual. They are typically benthic scavengers. So if you remember, they have those specialized appendages called calaria that they kind of scoop food into their mouth as they rummage along the, the bottom of the ocean. But what's really fascinating about these creatures is that they're actually fundamentally important to the healthcare industry. In fact, when these went extinct um, uh, about 800 years ago, the healthcare system um, took a tremendous hit until we could synthesize um, a specific uh, molecule that we were harvesting naturally from these horseshoe crabs. So here is an old picture of someone harvesting the blood of horseshoe crabs. So we go out and catch a bunch of these, bend them in half, a little disrespectful, and then tap into their dorsal blood vessel and drain a significant portion of their blood. Their blood is this beautiful kind of pewter blue if that's what pewter blue is, I don't know actually what that what pewter blue is, but in my mind that is uh, pewter blue, uh, very nice, very nice color. So this is because they have hemocyanin, so which is a respiratory pigment, not hemoglobin, and so the hemocyanin makes their their blood blue. But it is a specific protein in their blood, uh, an immune protein called coagulogen, that is. Um, incredibly sensitive to bacterial cell walls. So this is an, uh, an amoebocyte kind of immune response um, cell that basically gels, creates a, a, a gel-like substance around any bacteria. So when the horseshoe crab gets infected, the, the immune cells activate and secrete coagulogen, which coagulates um, around the bacterium. Well, they're so incredibly sensitive, that they can detect a bacterial cell wall part in one parts per trillion. And so for most of um, healthcare practices, all the sterilized equipment, the hospital uh, tables, the scalpels, the surgery instruments, everything that had to be completely sterile and free of bacterial contamination was um, verified to be sterile with a special, special sensors containing this, um, this um, coagulogen molecule. Even in the first, those ancient space shuttles, the International Space Station, one of the, one of the first, they would decontaminate that with a special um, probe that had coagulogen on it to make sure there's no bacterial contamination on the International, International Space Station. So these little creatures are incredibly, uh, were incredibly important, and um, when they went extinct, we, we took a little bit of a hit in our healthcare until we could figure out a new way to synthesize um, the molecule coagulogen. Pretty interesting animals. Very unlike animals like this, the sea spider in class Pycnogonida. And Pycnogonids are sea spiders. And as you can see here, they're in Chela serrata. Um, genus name here is Pycnogonum, which is just like the class, so it should be easy to remember. What you notice, we've got one, two, three, four um, walking legs. We have uh, chelicerae and pedipalps out here. The chelicerae are kind of modified into this sectorial proboscis that they use to attack their prey. At the back, if you notice, they don't really have an abdomen. So if you remember, the, most of these guys have two tagmata, a cephalothorax and an abdomen. And in the pycnogonidids, their abdomen is highly reduced. And so what are you missing if you're missing an abdomen? All the digestive glands and reproductive organs. So um, their digestive system actually extends into their hind legs as does their reproductive system. And uh, it's very, very, very odd. What do you notice about the middle of this picture? What is this little white mass here? This is a little bundle of baby sea spiders, little eggs. 
And so you know what sex is this sea spider? This is a male because males take care of their young and they do so with specialized appendages called ovigers. Ovigers, these egg, egg arms um, that are used to, to carry the, um, the brood of eggs there. So Pygnogonum, the sea spider, this one's a male, heavily reduced abdomen, sectorial, chelicerae, um, all marine organisms, and um, yeah, class Pygnogonida. All right, now we have the, the most species group, the, the arachnids, and arachnids contain many, many orders. First of all, we have the Araneans in um, order Araneae. This is Brachypelma, the Mexican red kneed tarantula. Tarantulas, um, some people used to keep them as pets. They're pretty docile creatures, not aggressive at all, even though they have these monstrous chelicerae, and they are venomous, but their venom is not extremely toxic to humans. If you got bit by one after you um, poked it and aggressed it for a long time, it might get angry and bite you eventually. Um, but it would feel like a, a bee sting, which is painful, but um, you'll get over it. Brachypelma are desert tarantulas from, from Mexico and the American, American Southwest. And um, they make little burrows and wander around usually at night. And they defend themselves um, most of the time by running away. And it's um, and then their secondary line of defense are all these these hairs. They have specialized hairs on their abdomen and legs. These hairs are called urticating hairs, U-R-T, urticating hairs, and they can be shed um, off really easily if an attacker if an, if an attacker gets too close. And these hairs have recurved barbs and they kind of burrow into the the skin and flesh especially mucous membranes, so mouth and nose and eyes, and can cause uh, pretty severe irritation. So uh, this is not something you want to pick up and juggle about and be really um, mean to. The, the hairs will embed themselves in your flesh and be quite irritating. And then eventually it might bite you, which would also be irritating. But it's more irritating for the spider, right? So just, just leave the spiders alone. So this is uh, Brachypelma, the Mexican red kneed tarantula. This beautiful specimen, Atrax robustus. This is the most venomous, tox, uh, most venomous spider um, on Earth, or at least it was. This is the Sydney funnel web spider, known um, for an incredibly toxic bite, especially in males. So uh, actually, males are significantly more toxic than females. Um, there's been no deaths known from females, but males have caused um, uh, many deaths in humans. Um, so Atrax robustus is a Sydney funnel web spider. Um, funnel web, as you can imagine, the female is going to make a funnel-like web. So it's like a trap door, but without the door, it's just a funnel. And then they have trip lines radiating out from there. The males wander around looking for the females during mating season, and so most of the, of the encounters between um, spiders and humans are going to be males. And the males are highly aggressive, which is very unusual um, for spiders, and you can kind of contrast this with the, the docile Brachypelma species. Um, but the males of Atrax are um, highly aggressive, and when they bite, they'll often bite several, several times and um, sink their fangs in really deeply and you often have to peel them off um, before they, they won't let go on their own. So this is a highly aggressive species. Um, interestingly, their venom doesn't really affect most mammals like it does humans. Um, it, it's, so it's a sodium ion channel blocker, and so it affects our, our nervous system. So it's, it's a neurotoxin. And uh, most mammals, it it doesn't affect too much. There is even some immunity in some, some rodent species. But primates, monkeys and apes and humans, are um, significantly affected. So, which is kind of strange because I don't think humans are their main prey species, obviously, and they don't go around um, eating monkeys. There's not a lot of monkeys in Australia. So why is it that their venom is so toxic to primates? I don't know for sure, but um, I would like to, so I should do more reading about it. Um, but what I, what I do know is that they, their main prey is, are insects, 
And so this, this venom has adapted to kill insects and insects have um, calcium and potassium channel ion inhibitors that this venom also um, disrupts. So I think this is an example of convergent evolution. There are some um, sodium ion channels in, in primates that are very similar to the ion channels in um, insects. Um, and so it's not that the spider has um, evolved the ability to attack primates specifically, it's just a unfortunate coincidence that we happen to share a, um, a nervous system property where the specific sodium ion molecule has the right um, lock and key combination for this particular toxic, uh, toxin to uh, bind to. So um, incredibly toxic to humans and other primates and insects, but other mammals are less affected. Atrax robustus, Sydney funnel web spider. Beautiful picture, but deadly. This one you may be familiar with. This is Loxosceles reclusa, the brown recluse spider. And as you can tell by its name, they are typically solitary living, um, living alone in um, dark parts of your homes um, and the forest and wherever else they live. Um, but this is a cytotoxic venom. So when you get bit by one of these, it's not going to be a systemic um, difficulty, but it's going to be a localized necrotic wound. These form something called volcanic lesions. This next picture is a little bit gross. Right here, someone's gotten bit on their ankle and a few Days to weeks later, you see just the, the tissue death surrounding the bite. Um, so this won't kill you, but it can be incredibly painful, uh, debilitating for a time, and lead to some significant scarring. What you notice here is a, just a remarkable little violin shape right on its cephalothorax. That's how you distinguish the brown recluse, Loxosceles reclusa, from other similar spiders. Look for that violin marking. That's very, very distinct. So if you see a brown and a uh, little brown spider, um, don't automatically think it's a brown recluse. It's got to have that nice little violin marking. Also, you probably have noticed whenever a spider dies, its legs kind of curl up. Why is that? Um, insects don't really do this. <clears throat> well, it's because their legs aren't as robust. They're not as sclerotized as the, the, the legs of insects. And so the legs of spiders are, um, a, a lot of it is pressurized, like a hydrostatic skeleton. So when they die, that pressure is released, or when their exoskeleton is punctured, that um, hydrostatic pressure is released and their legs crumple. So that's what's going on here. So watch out for brown recluse spiders, be able to identify them, know that they are, um, they have cytotoxic venom. What are these structures right here? Pedipalps, which would make these the chelicerae and then these, the little walking legs. Lactrodectus are, are widow spiders, and there are several different species. The most familiar um, for you are probably the black widows, but there are white widows and uh, brown widows um, as well. And these to me are just the, the most spidery looking spiders, um, al almost beautiful, the way their, their legs are sleek and black, almost silky. Um, these have a really potent neurotoxin, and they make little um, cobwebs in corners, especially in, in dark areas, under logs and in sheds, um, under your beds, and really potent neurotoxin, but they're not aggressive, um, but there are hundreds of people get bit by these every year, and I've actually had one crawl on my hand in the distant in the distant past when I was moving some logs and it wasn't it wasn't too frightening um, they're pretty docile creatures um, you probably know that they're called widows because of their propensity for eating their mates and we've talked about spider mating before and so it's not unusual for the female spiders to eat their male mates after mating or before mating or even during mating um, but widow spiders don't seem to do this any more than other spiders. We've just held them in captivity and so we can observe this behavior. Also, when you keep them in captivity, they're more likely to be aggressive and underfed and so you see traits, uh, behaviors they don't always see in the wild. So I think in the, in the wild, they probably don't eat their mates very often, but in captivity, uh, they eat whatever you give them.
including other widow spiders. The cobwebs they make are pretty interesting. Um, so you are probably familiar with the classic orb spider um, web that you run into when you're in the woods walking and it gets all over your face. Um, it makes you go crazy. Uh, well, there are um, those orb weavers, but there are also a lot of spiders that make these cobwebs, which aren't really uh, beautifully symmetrical webs. They kind of seem, they're asymmetrical and kind of um, almost chaotic with just strand, strands going everywhere. One hypothesis about why spiders make these um, intricate chaotic webs is as a defense against parasitoid wasps. So parasitoid wasps um, are, um, or spiders are a common prey of parasitoid wasps. And so to kind of prevent this flying demon from paralyzing you and dragging you off to feed her young, they just make this intricate web of crisscrossing um, sticky webs that are very difficult for a flying insect to navigate. So instead of just presenting yourself on the orb for anything to come and pluck off, um, they kind of hide in this intricate chaotic web. So that's one idea about why they make cobwebs in the first place. So even a black widow spider has things it's scared of. Maybe have a little bit of compassion on this poor soul. This one is not a spider. It is a harvestman, so a different order, order Opiliones. Phalangium is uh, the common harvestman. And these are some of the most common predators in forest ecosystems, uh, temperate rainforests. They're, they're incredibly common. And they eat all kinds of things, invertebrates, caterpillars, beetles, smaller spiders, um, a fungus, um, eggs, whatever they can eat. So they're kind of a generalist predator, really important for ecosystems. And these long spindly legs are easily uh, lost when they're attacked. This is called autotomy. And uh, you can see what are these things right here? Those are going to be the chelicerae. And we can know that because we have one, two, three, four walking legs. And then this little thing here would be their pedipalps. So uh, pedipalps and chelicerae look differently between all these orders, but be able to recognize what they are when I, when I point them out. And one thing that, di that differs between Opiliones and Arandaeans is the lack of a pedicel. So you just got one, um, essentially one body segment here. You don't have a subdivision between the cephalothorax and the abdomen that's really obvious and constricted like you do in spiders. Phalangium is the genus. Uh, phalangium, you know, think of phalanges, little fingers, long, uh, long fingers. These guys also get together in the winter, similar to Harmonia, the lady, lady uh, bugs, and they aggregate in large clumps. So if you ever see a large clump of kind of fuzzy, furry feet, don't poke it, or you'll get thousands of little harvestmen cascading down your tent. Scorpions are pretty unique um, arachnids. They, their pedipalps are modified into pinchers for grabbing their prey. And then they have a, um, a post abdomen, a post abdominal tail with a venomous stinger on it. And the venom in scorpions is very, very different. So it has a different delivery method and it's made from different, um, different kinds of protein than spider venom. Um, actually, we don't know for sure where the scorpion venom originated, but there's the, the genes for the venom share a lot of similarities to genes for the immune system. So one hypothesis is that, um, the the genes are kind of co-opted immune um, immune peptides, which kind of makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Um, but anyway, this is uh, the Arizona bark scorpion, um, Centroides. Centroides is the most venomous scorpion in North America, and it um, it likes hiding out in shoes and under logs. And so, if if people you know live in New Mexico or Arizona or Mexico. Um, and they leave your shoes outside, you're always gonna shake them out before putting them on because scorpions often like to hide in there. Um, at their peak abundance, we had hundreds of thousands of people being bitten every year in Mexico and the Southwest US. Very few deaths, um, but it causes incredible, incredible pain, um, tingling, um, muscle cramping, vomiting, um, fever. So it's not a pleasant, pleasant sting. It will be quite painful, but you will most likely not die. So this is Centroides, the Arizona bark scorpion. 
The last order we need to talk about are the is order Akari, and these are the ticks and mites. Ticks are important vectors of bacterial diseases. So this one here, Ixodes, is the black-legged tick or the deer tick, and this one's common in um, the uh, northeast um, United States. And you can see it has darker legs here. This little thing right here is called the the, the scutum. And this is the abdomen, and this is what swells up after it gets a nice uh, little blood meal. So Ixodes is the black-legged um, deer tick, black-legged tick or deer tick. And we can see here, these are the pedipalps, and then these are the chelicerae modified into a capitulum that they insert into their vertebrate host to suck their blood. Um, these transmit a bacteria, um, Borrelia, Burgdorferi. You don't need to know that name, but just know that the bacteria that it transmits causes um, Lyme disease. And Lyme disease is a, a very difficult disease to diagnose because it causes a lot of variable symptoms. So the initial onset, um, about 80% of people will have a bullseye rash that develops um, from, from the bite, and that's pretty characteristic. But after that, you might have fever and chills and vomiting and headaches. Um, then you might have swelling in your joints and fatigue, and th these symptoms can persist for months, even years. And so um, what we think happens is that the bacteria kind of uh, ride along your nervous system and hang out there in connective tissue, which is a place that your immune system is its hard to get to. And so they kind of survive hidden in your uh, nervous system and your, your connective tissue. So they can cause chronic pain, chronic fatigue, especially in joints, for, for a very, very long time. So this is um, Lyme disease caused by a bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, that's transmitted by Ixodes, the black-legged deer tick. Another unpleasant tick is Amblyoma americanum. This is the Lone Star tick, named after this... Um, star on its back. Uh, the f only females have that star on the scutum. Uh, males um, have variable markings, but the females have this nice, uh, nice little white dot on their backs that make them very distinctive. These are also common in um, Tennessee and in um, the eastern U.S. in general, and they transmit a lot of different bacteria that cause a lot of different diseases. One of the more interesting ones is called um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is um, a kind of a fever rash, and you get little spots of blood all over your body, and can be um, uh, really uh, dangerous, especially for um, immunocompromised people, the the young and the elderly. And so, um, Amblyoma americanum is the the Lone Star tick, very very common um, in Tennessee and Texas, and really all of the the eastern U.S. and causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. All right, we need to also learn two mites. So look at this, look at this creature. Very um, intimidating creature. Um, thankfully, this is a very tiny creature. We can see its legs, we can see its pedipalps, we can see its chelicerae, and we can see that the pedipalps and chelicerae are highly modified for kind of digging, scraping, piercing, crunching. So uh, Dermatophagoides is the dust mite. This is one of the most common animals um, on the planet. It occurs everywhere there are um, there is dust. So they are they eat fibers and keratin, dead skin cells. They survive off um, just little bits of organic material and they're incredibly numerous. So you have trillions of these in your home and in your in your clothes, on your windowsills, in your mattress and in your pillows. There is a study a few years ago that estimated that about 10% of the weight of a two-year-old pillow is due to um, dust mites and their feces. So if you have a pillow that's about two years old, you know, pick that up in your hands, feel the weight of it. About 10% of that weight is just these little creatures and their poop. So you share a bed with millions of these little companions, and which is very disturbing, um, but also at the same time, it's it's comforting, um, right? You have lots of little friends that rely on you for your for uh, their food, for they eat your dead skin cells, and most of the time they don't cause a lot of problems. 
and um, you know, a few minutes ago before you knew this fact, you were just fine. So um, you know, don't don't worry about it. These cause a lot of um, allergies in people. So if you're allergic to dust, you're most likely allergic to a specific um, protein in their exoskeleton, and so you're kind of allergic to these critters right here. Well, this one's not a pleasant looking creature for sure. This is Demodex. And Demodex um, have, they've got eight stubby little legs, not um, pedipalps or chelicerae to speak of, um, and their eyes are heavily reduced too. These are kind of degenerated um, mites. These are parasitic and they're kind of elongate, so you can kind of see that they're gonna live in kind of um, tunnels and kind of holes. Um, Demodex are the eyelash mites. So the tunnels they live in are your eyelashes. And so you can see their little tails sticking out here, heads buried into your follicles, where they eat the bacteria and the oils that your follicle secretes. And almost all of us have these little creatures in our eyelashes. They are commensal, so they don't cause problems um, usually. Unless they get too abundant or you get an, an, an infection, then they can cause um, uh, dermatitis. But generally, they're just our little silent companions. So we have uh, little arachnids all over our faces. Um, most of us do. Um, studies have uh, the prevalence ranges from about 23 to 100%, depending on community and um, age. But in healthy individuals, these are common um, creatures that live on us. They are uh, mostly harmless, they, um, so we don't need to worry about them. But I think if at night you're really, really quiet, you might be able to hear them talking to each other and maybe trying to communicate with you. So tonight as you go to sleep, just think about all the mites that live um, around you and in you and on you and uh, reach out and see if they want to be friends. So Demodex, the, the face mite. Here is a happy little Demodex and you can see its stubby little legs. See, it looks like a friendly little, little, little guy. All right, have a good night.